Hi, I'm Jillian Galley. I am the project director of the Digital Archaeological Archive of Comparative Slavery, which is based at Monticello. Uh, I think I have the best job at Monticello uh, for many reasons. I get to look at amazing archaeological collections almost every day that relate to sites of enslaved African and African American um, domestic households across North America and the Caribbean. I get to do incredible field work across the Caribbean and occasionally get invited to do work in the American South as well. And uh, most importantly, I get to work with an amazing group of scholars across North America, the Caribbean and the UK as we work to address some perduring questions in how enslaved Africans negotiated the early modern Atlantic world. This project is based at, da uh, based at Monticello. Uh, the archive was founded in 2000, and it is actually the longest running digital archive related to archeology span um, in the world. We're a research archive that has a very specific regional and topical focus. And the regional focus is that of sort of the uh, North America and Caribbean worlds in the early Atlantic period. That's around 1500 to uh, the late 19th century. So the archive is an it's an online um, digital archive, and it contains detailed standardized information about archaeological assemblages. That's artifacts, field records, maps, and images that are created when an archaeologist excavates a site. We make all those data standardized and we make them available to the public and to scholars for free over the internet. We have a, a really wide audience of users, archive users. Uh, they include archaeologists, historians, anthropologists, uh, scholars who study decorative arts and material culture generally. Uh, and then we also uh, find that the public and um, uh, secondary uh, level school teachers also use the archive for research and work. Um, we collaborate uh, broadly and much of the talk today actually will not just include me, but uh, this is the exciting part, a whole host of my colleagues and collaborators, folks I've been working with in some cases for over 15 years on developing the archive and the data that go in them. So after about 10 minutes, I'm gonna actually turn this presentation over to my colleagues and you'll get to hear about some of the projects that they're working on uh, in collaboration with DAX. Um, so the archive is, uh, is based at Monticello and we receive tremendous support from Monticello, but all of our programs predominantly run on grant funding. Um, so we are sustained by a significant endowment seeded by the National Endowment for the Humanities with major grant funding as well from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, um, additional funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, as well as some funding from Save America's Treasures and um, the National Science Foundation. So I run the project, but I have a fabulous staff of three archaeologists who work daily on um, bringing the collections into the archive. Uh, and then um, also we have sort of satellite labs across the country and in the Caribbean that are also entering data. Um, so when we were founded, when the archive was founded in 2000, we had two main goals. And the first goal was to facilitate comparative archaeological research on how slavery and enslaved life ways changed over time and space using archaeological data. And then the second goal was to create usable standards for recording and cataloging archaeological data that could be used by anyone working on any time period. Uh, we were driven to do this because there are a, sort of a series of historical questions that archaeologists are, are really well suited to address um, and that historians may have difficulty in some respects addressing with just primary sources when it comes to talking about the lives of the millions of enslaved Africans who were uh, forced into slavery in the in the uh, United States and the North America and the Caribbean. So we have questions about how economic and demographic changes in the 18th century impacted uh, enslaved people as they were forced across the world. Um, how did enslaved 
uh, people participate in the consumer revolution? Did they go to markets? What sorts of goods did they buy? How did they earn money to do so? And we know they earn money to do so um, based on the archeological data that we recover. Uh, what did enslaved people eat? What sort of hunting and subsistence strategies did they have? And how did that impact their households and also their, their life, their well-being? Um, how, as archaeologists, might we uncover African and spiritual practice, African cultural and spiritual practices? Um, and can we see how those practices change over time and space? Um, and then also, uh, we have there are a series of questions about how enslaved individuals were housed and what were some of the key factors that impacted housing um, in. Uh, Virginia, in South Carolina, in the Caribbean uh, over time. So um, why, why do these? Why tackle these questions uh, using archaeological data? And, and uh, you know, what, do, what kind of archaeological data do we have to put to these questions? Uh, actually, archaeologists have been working on sites of slavery since the late 1960s. And these are just a few images of some of the most iconic, well-known early excavations uh, that took place at Monticello, uh, at Curbu Plantation in South Carolina, and by Barry Higman in um, Montpelier Estate in Jamaica. Uh, and these sites, and now thousands more sites, have all been excavated in a host of different ways, from uh, sort of shoveling and removing plow zone to full area excavation to, uh, this is my wonderful colleague, Ivor Conley, who you're going to hear about soon, with his head in a very narrow, very deep shovel test pit. So all these sites have been dug in different ways, and some of them have been stored like this. And other sites uh, get, have been curated like this. But regardless of how they're curated, um, they are all the hundreds of thousands of artifacts that come off of these sites are really difficult for research to get at, researchers to access. Um, you can imagine bags of artifacts in those boxes don't easily translate into data that can be used um, to do statistical analyses or to understand long-term patterns in the archaeological record. So we, um, we created standards and a, a SQL Server database to put um, all of, to recatalog uh, site, all the archaeological material from the sites we work with. So we um, have our two goals of creating usable standards and addressing questions about slavery over time and space. And there are a couple of ways we meet those goals. We offer scholars and the public free and easy access to the archaeological data. We've worked deeply with uh, collaborating archaeologists and historians across the country and across the Caribbean to develop protocols that are um, usable and accessible and meets the needs of what they wish to be studying. And we also ensure, I think most critically, that all the data we collect conform to a single set of standards. Uh, what that means is we actually primarily bring the collections to Monticello in their, um, you know, kind of raw form, if you will. So this slide shows um, a colleague of mine, Leslie Cooper, working with piles of written paper notes and hand-drawn penciled maps, and then transferring them into the database as well as digitizing them into um, ArcGIS. And we provide all those maps and shape files for free online as well, so scholars can use those, um, have access to those maps. And then we also bring the collections to Monticello. That often means renting a U-Haul and filling it full of hundreds of Hollinger boxes of artifacts and they get um, brought to our office and we physically catalog each and every artifact um, that comes that came out of that site. Um, so it's a huge project and it has taken us over 20 years to get where we are today. Uh, when our website first launched in 2004, there were 10 sites from Virginia in the database and we had 600,000 records. Um, our collaborators were focused all, primarily in Virginia, um, and uh, and uh, the steering committee went beyond Virginia, but we were working with institutions and museums in Virginia at that time. And this is sort of what, if you will, is our social network look like at this point with DAX in the center and working with Mount Vernon, Colonial Williamsburg, obviously all the sites at Monticello and Poplar Forest. 
Now in 2020 today, we work with uh, universities, uh, museums, and other archeological institutions and government institutions across um, North America and the American South. There are 85 archeological sites in DAX with over 4 million records and growing every day. Uh, and this is actually what our, our DAX network looks like today um, with the different islands we're collaborating with and scholars and universities across the country. So collaborators and funders are key. This is you know, the theme of this talk. Um, we've got well over 65 collaborating archeologists and graduate students working with us now. Um, grants, grantors are critical, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, as well as key institutional and technical support that come from Monticello, uh, the Institute for Advanced Technology and the Humanities at the University of Virginia, and Convoy, which is our a wonderful website design firm that we've been working with for over 20 years. So without um, the financial and intellectual and technical support, um, DAX wouldn't exist. It's truly a collaborative project. Uh, this is just a quick snapshot of collaborators um, that we are currently working with. There's more details about our collaborators on our website. Uh, and speaking of our website, just quickly, uh, I'm going to give you a static glance, but you can get, I hope you have your phones, you can get right on them and uh, put in www.dax.org and, uh, and, and head right over to our current website. Um, there are these wonderful uh, artifact galleries that allow you to see in-depth I think really fabulous pictures of specific artifact types, as well as um, sort of stories, artifact stories about specific sites, like the South Grove mid in at Mount Vernon or the dry well at Monticello. Um, also, if you um, want to get into some of the really geeky information, you could dig deep into the archaeological site sections of the website where you can look at site maps, you can read discursive information, and of course, you can download um, artifact records from the, the millions of artifacts we have in, in DAX. Um, so as uh, I want to turn this over to my colleagues and, and my friends in a moment, um, but to, before I get there, I, I want to say that um, you know for about 15 years, we really did this work primarily at Monticello um, because of the way the technology behind our system worked. We'd go out and collaborate um, in the Caribbean doing field work or working with collections in Jamaica and Nevis and St. Kitts, or we would <clears throat> go to South Carolina uh, and work with our colleagues there. Uh, and during this time, though, people kept really saying to us, we'd really like to use your database. How can we make that happen? And in 2013, uh, thanks to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, we received a grant to put our database in the cloud and develop an online um, data entry interface that allows scholars with an internet connection anywhere in the world to log into the database and to catalog their own sites into what we call the back end, the, the back the database that drives the public facing archive. Um, and so that was a real game changer for us. And it uh, has allowed us to increase the number of sites in docs, but it's really allowed us to move this um, database, this piece of the technology we've been using out to more scholars for free. Uh, they come, they train with us at Monticello, and you'll hear from some of our colleagues about their experience training with us on how to use the database, but also uh, to ensure that their material culture identifications are in line with our material culture identifications. Um, and so this whole project is now called the DAX Research Consortium. And the goal really is to um, become a really useful model for how the web can encourage new kinds of scholarly collaboration and data sharing among archeologists. So um, we, as I just said, we offer our partners access to the database um, and they, um, when we started, they agreed to undertake a case study and they all came to Monticello to train with us. Uh, we took our old SQL Server Postgres, uh, I mean, our old SQL Server database and transformed it into an open source Postgres SQL database. This is some of the technical details you can look at later on the recording if you're interested. Um, we brought all of our partners together for a two week workshop, um, basically 10 days of training at Monticello where we all sat and got to um, 
analyze artifacts and, and learn how to use the database. Um, got to teach everyone how to use the database. These are just some shots of folks working together and cataloging together. Um, and so now the project was successful. And as a result, we now train archaeologists at Monticello in our protocols. We will travel to their sites to train um, scholars as well. And then they can um, catalog directly into the system. Uh, in 2018, we received a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities that's expanding the DAX Research Consortium right now. Uh, this coming summer, uh, as long as the pandemic is under control, we'll be having month-long fellowships for scholars to come, 20 scholars to come work with us uh, for one month at Monticello on um, learning the database and getting certified in the material culture protocols for the system. And coming in spring of 2021 as part of that grant is a new DAX website. So keep your eyes open for that. Um, it will be launched probably in February or March of this year and will provide a really new, slick, easy way to search and find information that you're interested in. So um, because we're trying to keep this podcast or this live stream short, and I want to make sure that my colleagues get their time, I'm going to actually turn it over um, to my first colleague, Dr. Karen Smith. Let's see if she can. Hi. Hi, Karen. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. It's so excellent to have you. Um, the pandemic brings us together in new ways um, and, and makes, I think, the, I hope makes the work we do more accessible to more people. So um, Karen is uh, an archaeologist with the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. She works in their Heritage Trust program. Uh, but before Karen moved to uh, South Carolina now over nine years ago. She was the curator of archaeological collections at Monticello and worked very closely with Dax. And when she headed to South Carolina, she took it with her. So I'll let you <laughs> tell us about what, how you use Dax. Sure. Um, well, uh, thank you, Jillian, for uh, the introduction and for the invitation to um, share how we use Dax uh, here um, at the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources uh, and uh, at sites across uh, South Carolina. Um, I'm going to talk about my collaborations with DAX sort of chronologically because um, that's how it that's how it works in my head. Uh, so as Jillian mentioned, uh, I moved to South Carolina in 2013 uh, from Virginia uh, so that my husband and I could uh, put our dirt together, <laughs> in the words of the late Cornelia Bailey, um, because why else would you leave uh, Monticello, uh, as Jillian mentioned, such a great place to, to work. Um, so uh, in South Carolina, I was initially employed by the South Carolina Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology um, as the director of their archaeological contract division. Uh, and my division at the Institute was responsible for doing contract archaeology across the state uh, from survey level work to larger scale excavations. Uh, and the contract division, um, I quickly came to realize, uh, did not have a database. Um, so I remember having this conversation with myself in my office in Columbia. Uh, you know, do I try to make my own database? Um, or, you know, why not reach out to Jillian about using DAX um, as the database uh, at the Institute? Um, and I, uh, you know, as she mentioned, this. Um, was an opportunity for us because of the development work that was done in 2013 and 2014. I believe it was 2014 when the DAX database, um, the cataloging interface um, yeah. went, went live online. And so as Jillian mentioned, you could access the database from anywhere with an internet connection. Um, and this really opened the door for us to use, uh, to use the DAX database in our work in South Carolina. Um, so one of the first projects we did um, after um, having access to DAX, uh, and I should say Jillian agreed uh, uh, to, to collaborate with us on that, and um, uh, we're, uh, we were grateful for that. Uh, so uh, one of our first survey and testing uh, uh, contracts was on the Fort Frederick uh, Heritage Preserve. Uh, and you're looking at um, actually a picture of our one of our final excavation shots. Uh, this is a mid 18th century British tabby fort. Uh, located on the Buford River uh, near Port Royal, South Carolina. Um, it's a small property. It's only three, uh, three acres, um, but it has archaeological, archaeological deposits, um, not only associated with the British fort, but also 
uh, with the John Joyner Smith uh, antebellum plantation. Um, so John Joyner Smith uh, enslaved as many as 130 um, Africans and African Americans on what was then a Sea Island cotton plantation uh, from 1796 until the Civil War. Um, and we also know from historical records that uh, this is one of the first places where the Emancipation Proclamation was read outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, in uh, January of 1863. Um, and so it's an important property for a number of reasons. Uh, and in 2014 and early 2015, um, in my role at the Institute, we surveyed the entire property um, and then opened up test units both in the antebellum uh, and the colonial period occupations at, uh, at the site. Um, and so um, I hired one of one of the DAX research uh, consortium trainees uh, to catalog our work uh, at Fort Frederick into the DAX database. Um, and then I did some routine um, sort of standard DAX uh, type analyses uh, for the report, um, including this the Harris matrix here um, at the bottom of the slide uh, and just uh, some of the um, glass beads that we uh, that we found in the antebellum part of the property. Um, next slide. Yeah, uh, and it was um, through, but we also work um, both at the Institute and at DNR on um, pre prehistoric pre Columbian sites in South Carolina. Uh, and we use the database to, to catalog that material as well. Uh, and as a result of that, we have contributed um, important stone, uh, locally important stone material types. Um, this is Black Mingo Chert on the left. Um, as well as a number of new stylistic elements um, and both the material types and these, and these stylistic elements uh, go into the DAX um, cataloging manuals. Um, and I'll, I'll just mention that the, the pottery on the, on the right here uh, is 4,000 years old uh, and uh, shows subtle differences in um, the punctation um, types on the, on the surface of those sherds. Um, that's a little periwinkle uh, marsh snail that's used to create these create those punctations. Uh, next slide. Um, so uh, so that's my work at the institute. In 2018, um, I moved over to the Heritage Trust Program, which is part of the Department of Natural South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. Um, the Heritage Trust Program archaeologists were already um, very interested in adopting DAX as their database. Uh, into which all of the Heritage Trust Program um, archaeology, uh, archaeological work uh, goes. Uh, and it was their enthusiasm for DAX that was uh, really one of the things that drew me to the program. Um, the Heritage Trust Program was established by an act of the South Carolina General Assembly in 1974 uh, to set aside and protect uh, heritage preserves and sites for the benefit of present and future generations. Um, this is a program, as I mentioned, within the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. And I'll just say here, too, that there are 74 heritage preserves uh, covering a total of almost 100,000 acres uh, throughout the state of South Carolina. And 17 of those um, preserves are specifically cultural uh, heritage preserves. Um, so we manage those properties. Uh, next slide. Um, so since I've been with the Department of Natural Resources and the Heritage Trust Program, uh, we I had a chance to go back to the Fort Frederick Heritage Preserve uh, to uncover the remains of a structure that we had identified in 2015 during our testing effort. Um, and we're just beginning to catalog this material, um, but I, I don't know, Jillian, uh, since you're live with me here too, we, I don't want to put you on the spot, but we may have some new stylistic elements uh, to yeah, add to the glossary. Definitely. Um, I don't know, the top one might be Molded Edge 1, uh, but we can talk about it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a new one. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's exciting too. And as, actually, as well as the second one, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. So one of the great things, um, not just about being able to catalog directly into DAX um, from South Carolina, uh, but to actually use it in the field, you know, we can pull up these these glossaries in the field as the stuff's coming out of the screen and, and you know, engage with our, um, our, um, our team and yes. visitors uh, about, you know, uh, these sorts of questions. Um, so that's, that's fun. Uh, next slide. Um, and then I, we've also at DNR been working on a 4,000 year old uh, shell ring site that um, it's a two ring site, but one of the rings is um, eroding into the Atlantic Ocean at a really pretty astonishing rate. 
Um, it's located on our Botany Bay Plantation Heritage Preserve uh, in Charleston County. Um, and I just want to point out here, uh, it's an opportunity to point out that we've always used paper forms in the field um, to record individual excavation contexts. That's what we're doing here on the left. Uh, but last year, uh, we started entering context directly into DAX using our iPads. Um, and that's been a real time saver for us. Uh, and I, I just can't imagine going back uh, to some of those paper forms. Um, uh, and I just wanted to point that out. And then the other thing I want to mention, and I'll, and I'll wrap up, um, access to DAX um, during the pandemic has allowed our catalogers to keep working. So they take a few boxes home. Uh, you know, check those boxes out, uh, particularly from Pocky, uh, from this, this work at Pocky um, Shell Ring. Uh, catalog it there at home where they've got an internet connection, access to the database. Um, and in fact, since uh, we sort of went on lockdown in March, they've cataloged over 100,000 artifacts uh, from this site wow. uh, into the database. So that I think we're a little bit more productive at home than we, than we <laughs> are in the lab. But um, anyway, that's my story uh, about our collaborations. And um, thank you. <laughs> Oh, thanks for joining us. That's excellent. Um, and uh, I think one of the one of the real things that I've I loved continuing to work with you after you left Monticello, um, but is for me, um, and I think you know for all of us at DAX is expanding into the contact period and pre-contact period. Um, so getting to see prehistoric material and understand how Native Americans who were still in South Carolina when um, Europeans, yes. the slave Africans, showed up are, are all interacting. And I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that next with Sarah Stroud Clark, but um, it's, it's one of the things I love about, about working with you. And, um, and I'll just say quickly, I think, um, I think it's Fraser who says, uh, my former boss, your, yeah. uh, your colleague and uh, um, director of archaeology at Monticello, who says that um, archaeological data are archaeological data, right? I, I get asked a lot, well, why are you using a historical database for for this older yeah, material and I, exactly. you know, and I just I quote Fraser there and he's right <laughs> exactly so. exactly as long as they're they're put into the right categories and right. standardized the right way right, right. exactly and described in the cataloging manuals yep that's right. That's right. Um, and and also we'll, we'll move on to Sarah Stroud Clark. But I I just want to say it's a great point about the pandemic. We too um, thanks so much to the Mellon Foundation and to the National Endowment for the Humanities. We've you know set up with funding from them. We're able to set up this system that keeps us all working through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know we've mm -hmm. got um, at, at uh, down in, in Virginia. You know DAC staff has collections from Flower 200 all at home, and they're just cataloging away. So work can continue um, for us uh, at home very easily because of yeah. the system. So thank you for bringing that up. OK, uh, we'll bring Karen back in at the end if there are any questions from the audience. But right now, I want to move on to um, actually, it's, it's to Dr. Gifford Waters. Um, this is actually a great transition when we talk about a historic to prehistoric um, or historic prehistoric and contact period archaeology. Uh, Gifford is the collections manager for historical archaeology at the Florida Museum of Natural History. Um, and we've been working together along with uh, Dr. Charlie Cobb, who's the curator for uh, the Florida, uh, curator of historical archaeology for the Florida Museum of Natural History um, for a long time on various projects related to early Spanish missions. And um, we're hoping to move on to uh, work with St. Augustine. And I'll let Gifford tell you more about uh, what we've been doing. Yes, thank you for the introduction, Jillian. And um, and thanks you know, for inviting me to participate in this. Oh, yeah. um, as Jillian said, I'm at the Florida Museum of Natural History and I'm the collection manager for the historical archeology span collections. And with the curator of historical archeology, span Charlie Cobb, we have been working with DAX um, since at least 2015, in two th we started the work and in 2016, we received a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to um, do sort of a test program to see if we could work with the existing database that DAX has established um, and use it for Spanish colonial sites as well as all of the sites that DAX has already been working with. And so you, you can go ahead and switch to the next slide if you like. Um, and so what we came up with was the idea to start with a few collections from Spanish mission sites in Florida. And these all date from the 
16 to 1700s, uh, mostly within that 17th century time period. And to get this started, we worked with DAX both in Virginia at Monticello, as well as having the DAX staff come down to the Florida Museum of Natural History to look at the artifacts. And we did training both uh, for ourselves and the uh, graduate students and colleagues that we were gonna be working with to do data entry, as well as training for the DAC staff as well, because a lot of this material culture was not, um, was not artifacts that they were used to seeing since we're in a different uh, situation with Spanish colonial sites. And one of the big issues with this, um, just like in South Carolina is we have a very large Native American component to these sites as one would expect with Spanish mission sites. And I would say about 95% of all the artifacts that are coming from these sites are Native American ceramics, lithic tools, et cetera. And only about 5% are European artifacts. And then within those uh, European artifacts, about 95% of that is Spanish artifacts, a lot of which was not already in the DAX database. So we worked very closely on going over the standardization of what makes different uh, ceramic types types and codifying those and getting them into the DAX manuals so that all of this analysis could be standardized and entered into the database. Um, and once we got the training done and we started working on uh, one site at a time, and we now have three Spanish mission sites in what we're calling the uh, Comparative Mission Archaeology Portal or CMAP, and um, hopefully a link to the CMAP website will come up in the uh, discussions. Um, and so that's what it looks like. We can go back and we'll talk, uh, go okay. back one slide. I forgot the order that these were in. That's all right. Um, so as you can see, um, we had to work with the DAX staff to modify the database so that we could accommodate the Spanish colonial and Native American material culture types. Um, the, the image that you see here with the uh, ceramics, those are all Spanish mahalicas of different types. Some of those actually come from Spain and Italy. Others were produced after the Spaniards arrived into the quote unquote new world and began ceramic production in Mexico. So some of those come from Mexico City and from Puebla. And based on historical documents and archeology, span we know the origin and date ranges of production of a number of these uh, ceramic types, which is very helpful to archeologists. The smaller picture with the triangles, those are um, lithics, uh, projectile points or arrowheads. And this type is a locally quarried stone uh, chert. And these are called Pinellas points. They're very distinctive and they date to the late uh, prehistoric and into the historic period. And we actually even have documentary records that talk about at various times because of the fear of British attacks on these mission sites, the, the Spanish government required that Native American men at all times had a bow and a quiver of 20 to 30 arrows on them at one time. So we know that these particular types were still being used during the Spanish mission period. And so we worked very closely with DAX, especially with the lithic technology and Charlie Cobb, the curator at the Florida Museum of Natural History, um, really helped to develop a brand new lithic module that could be used but now, not just by us, but by anybody that's using the DAX database and that is finding, you know, that has a large lithic component to their sites. And, you know, so we've constantly been working back and forth to help modify and grow the database so that it can be used by more and more archaeologists recognizing the need for standardization in how we do the analysis and record the data. Um, and so once we've done, did all the analysis and entered it into the database, um, we pushed it live through our website, which you can see on the next page, CMAP or the Comparative Mission Archaeology Portal. And all of the data that we've generated in the database right now is only being pushed out through, even though it's in the DAX database, it's only live on our site. But just like um, with the DAX database that's online, researchers, general public, anybody that's interested in Spanish mission archaeology can come and look at um, not just the database itself, but we also have 
historic maps, um, descriptions of the excavation context, um, maps of the excavations. And because we're working, because we've worked with a lot of historians, we actually know stories of individual people at some of these mission sites. And so we also present those stories um, to give a more personal feel to the archeology span and the sites that we've been looking at. And what we're really excited about now that Jillian mentioned is that we're now working on our next collaboration with DAX and we're going to attempt to get grant funding and hopefully, and it looks like it's going well so far. And we're gonna begin entering the data from all of the numerous excavations that Dr. Kathleen Deegan and others have done in the colonial city of St. Augustine and get all of that data up and online and made available and free to everybody to use. And we're really excited about this. And we're gonna start with, um, I think four different households that span the, span the first Spanish period to the British period to the second Spanish period as well. So we can look at different economic classes as well as changes through time of artifact categories, people's activities, and what's really exciting about this is one of the neglected areas of archaeology in St. Augustine, some people have touched on it, but not enough, is to look at the, the lives of both free and enslaved Africans in the Spanish colonies, as well as during the time period that it was British, um, that 20-year period. And the African presence remained from the Span first Spanish period into the, second, into the British period period and into the second Spanish period. Fort Mose, which is on the north side of St. Augustine, is recognized as the first free African community in what's now the United States. Um, but we also know that there were free and enslaved Africans in the colonial city uh, throughout all three uh, cultural periods. And we're really excited to be working with DAX because their expertise in this area will really help us to get a better understanding of this very important issue. Um, and I think there's one more slide there that just shows that now we're moving from the missions, which was basically a frontier area into a true colonial city with households, um, wells, barrel wells. That's the, the, the one image that you see you know, spaced out at regular intervals. And we're really excited to look at these households of different economic status, different time periods, and people from different areas of the world. They're not all from Spain. You have Spaniards, um, you know, British folks, um, Native Americans, Africans, all living together in what truly was the first melting pot of you know, the United States. And we're really excited and look forward to uh, continuing our collaboration with DAX. Excellent. Thank you, Gifford. We're, we're, we're really excited as well. Um, and uh, you, you brought up Fort Mose, um, which is uh, you know, adjacent to uh, St. Augustine. And in fact, next summer, pandemic per permitting, uh, Dr. Lori Lee, who's at Flagler University um, in St. Augustine, will actually be a fellow with us working to include the um, data from Fort Mose from Kathy Deegan's work there. So uh, the hope is, is that we'll be building this really amazing data set for sort of the Northeastern coast of uh, Florida. Yes, and we're looking forward to it. <laughs> All right. Well, um, looking at the time, I realize we sort of have to move on. I'm going to bring uh, Sarah Stroud Clark in. She's the director of museum affairs for Drayton Hall. Uh, we've been working together for nearly a decade on um, getting archaeological sites uh, from Drayton Hall into the DAX database, and we hope soon up online too for the public. Yes. Yeah, take it away. <laughs> We're so excited about that uh, prospect. <laughs> it's been a, it's been a, a long go. Yeah. Uh, so if I can have the slides. There we go. Uh, for those of you that might not know, Drayton Hall is located just outside of Charleston, South Carolina, about 12 miles. It is an early 18th century plantation site uh, that was designed by John Drayton. Uh, I know we have Monticello on this call, but we believe that Drayton Hall is the first and best example of Palladian architecture in North America. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, but archaeologically, it uh, is just an amazing site. Uh, archaeology started there in 1974 when the property was transferred out of the Drayton family to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And the map you see at the bottom of the slide is from uh, the, a well we call the South Flanker Well. Uh, which on your screen in the top picture was located on the right side of the property, uh, just outside of that flanker. Uh, and it was excavated in 1979 and 1980, a really wonderful excavation and just packed fill, full of artifacts. And so this was one of the the major projects that we wanted to get into DAX. And much like Karen talked about earlier, uh, when my colleagues and I kind of arrived at Drayton Hall, we found that we didn't have an electronic database, a modern database. And so we were really kind of starting from scratch. And that's where our partnership with DAX has just been really, really wonderful. Um, I had the pleasure of going up to Monticello a few times. Uh, this is in 2014 when I was part of the DAX uh, Research Consortium training, which is just an amazing uh, resource. I'm so excited for all of the new scholars that are going to be going through there, um, hopefully soon, if this pandemic <laughs> will cooperate. Uh, myself, I was a DAX fellow in 2012, and that's how I got my start uh, with DAX. And so I was working on a, a different well context, a pre-Drayton well context. And again, uh, Drayton Hall is a site that covers many centuries of occupation uh, from historic Native Americans. Uh, there are some earlier colonial uh, sites on the property. And of course, the, the main um, uh, period of the the Drayton family. And so if we can go one more. Uh, these are some of the collections uh, from Drayton Hall. Again, uh, we had an enormous uh, legacy collection uh, that we are dealing with. Um, so the pre-Drayton well is from the, the mid 80s. And right now we have a wonderful Dax uh, fellow, um, Corey Sate Satis. Uh, there's Corey. Uh, and this is really one of the ways that Dax has been so important to Drayton Hall. Uh, Corey's funding for the last four years have has come from a private fellowship and from uh, the Gaylord and Dorothy Donnelly Foundation, um, specifically because of the connection that Dax has with comparative slavery. Uh, and so the work uh, that Corey has specifically been doing on colon aware uh, at Drayton Hall, uh, a specific uh, type of uh, ceramic made, uh, we believe, by enslaved Africans and Native Americans. Uh, Corey has been um, just doing some really amazing groundbreaking research with the Colin O'Ware collections at Drayton Hall. Uh, here we are with some of our colleagues um, in the Charleston area. I'll plug that Corey's actually helping run an entire uh, day-long uh, webinar on Saturday about Colin O'Ware and the work that she's been doing through DAX. So uh, DAX is just an amazing collaboration. I really can't say that uh, more. It's just, it's been a joy to even be on this call today and seeing all of uh, my colleagues' faces uh, from around the East Coast. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And um, we'll, we'll definitely be at the Colino workshop on the 24th. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but um, the, the work with Drayton Hall has just been um, really exciting and has helped us at DAX think about Colino ware, this low fired coarse earthenware ceramic that we see on sites across the United States. Across the American South, and um, and then we see sort of a, a version in the Caribbean as well. And so, um, you know, you have a tremendous collection, and it's really helped us think about these wear types and how they functioned um, for enslaved and Native Americans and uh, this time period. So, um, moving on, I'm going to bring Sean Devlin up. So, Sean is the curator of archaeological collections at Mount Vernon. 
Uh, we've been working with Mount Vernon from the beginning of DAX. Uh, starting in 2000, there have always been a Mount Vernon archaeologist on our steering committee uh, or trained in the database to use the database. Um, there are a number of Mount Vernon sites currently in DAX and more coming. Uh, and uh, Sean is also a, a PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota. And um, I guess maybe five years ago, I roped Sean into doing his dissertation at Stewart Castle in Jamaica, which is a site that uh, I excavate on with Ivor Conley, uh, who we'll hear from next. Um, but at any rate, uh, Sean took that on uh, as well as a dissertation site. So Sean's going to talk about both Mount Vernon and uh, sort of how he works with us as a graduate student. Yeah, thanks, Jillian, for uh, having me today. Uh, I, I feel like I'm kind of sitting at the nexus of a lot of the folks we've already heard and the folks we'll hear yeah. next. I th I'll probably, uh, speaking both from an institutional and a personal level as well, uh, it's sort of that collaborative experience, I think I'll probably hit a lot of the same topics. Uh, so I'll kind of maybe uh, shortcut some of them. Okay. Um, but what, if we could pull up the slide, yeah. As, as Jillian said, Mount Vernon has uh, been with DAX since the very beginning. Um, and a I should really say, I've, I've been at Mount Vernon since 2016 in my capacity as the uh, curator of the archaeological collection and and our our partnership really uh, is due to my predecessors uh, or a number of my predecessors uh, Esther White Elnor Green particularly um, really sort of uh, were were key partners I think for you guys early on and 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 we're obviously indebted to the to the work that they put in and sort of uh, put us on the right path here. Um, so we can actually say this is uh, the, the event that uh, lots of folks have shown uh, the greatest party in 2014. Um, uh, here's hoping that we can get back to those days. Um, but as I sort of mentioned, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, some of Mount Vernon's earliest sites that were excavated, the House for Families, the main uh, quarter for enslaved individuals living on the on George Washington's home farm uh, from about the uh, middle of the 18th century through uh, his death and, uh, or sorry, through its destruction in 1793. Um, that site was one of the first that went into DAX. Um, Eleanor's uh, dissertation work actually was uh, 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 focused on a site called the South Grove Midden, which is the main midden site associated with the uh, activities inside the mansion house and also the kitchen. Uh, so obviously uh, a lot of the material there, what was most interesting, I think, is right sort of it, it began to to uh, work towards this notion of looking at um, enslaved lives, also looking at planters' lives, also thinking about material and maybe disentangling some of our traditional approaches where we might say this is an object that speaks to slavery and this is an object that speaks to planter life, right? Yeah. What uh, what Eleanor's work and 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 through sort of the the detailed analysis that Dax really drove uh, and that we continue to have at Mount Vernon is we begin to really look at these objects and think about the ways that they 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 operate in these multiple modes uh, and, and can really speak to the the um, community of a plantation and sort of the, the, the practices that are taking place there, um, the complex practices that are taking place there over time. Um, so this this is uh, Eleanor's baby, and we are so glad to, to be able to still have it out there in the world. This is um, uh, a website that was put together focused on the South Grove Midden, uh, has all of the object data that was cataloged into DAX, um, uh, beautiful imagery. Um, and also what's fantastic is it also ties documentary sources into, uh, into the analysis as well. Um, uh, so actually going forward, just because of institutional particularities, uh, we, we wanted to sort of continue to bring these objects to the public. Um, uh, and particularly uh, Mount Vernon has a, a heavy educational focus. You know, uh, uh, back before the pandemic, we had a, a million visitors a year and, and a substantial portion of them are, are school agers, uh, being in the, the nation's capital and being George Washington's home. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so, so we uh, were able to, to work with Jillian and, 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 and the DAX crew to sort of host um, a, a material culture website on our on our uh, a material culture page on our website at Mount Vernon, that really highlights these objects and allows us to present both um, scholarly information, sort of detailed uh, measurement information that we might record out of the database, but also to uh, provide interpretive text that might be helpful for. Um, school age children, high school children, college children, uh, um, and, and even scholars, but sort of to frame up a nice um, uh, sort of cross section of how material culture might be helpful for a whole range of, of students and scholars. Um, and again, that's that's really the, uh, you know, we, we, we came about doing this project um, two years ago, I think. Um, and 
And uh, there would have been quite a buildup. Uh, this is going to be uh, uh, horribly difficult and stuff. And, and once we actually got involved and talked to Jillian um, and, and, and our own great IT and media staff, um, really, it was amazing to see the way that we could use DAX, uh, publish this information on that website, but also that information was easily available for us to also um, sort of massage and, and use for purposes, educational purposes on our own website as well. Uh, so maybe the next slide would be a good one. Uh, so I think where my sort of main contribution comes into the Mount Vernon story is uh, sort of, it had started just before I, I, I sort of came on board, uh, but Mount Vernon, uh, as lots of people had uh, have already mentioned, right, um, a lot of these institutions have multiple catalogs or multiple systems in which things have been cataloged over the course of years. And Mount Vernon had had archaeology done as early as the 1930s. So we had a, a wide array of different systems in place um, that were tracking collections and objects through and trying to make interpretive statements about, you know, what what kinds of objects were available, how were people using them uh, at Mount Vernon uh, uh, over the course of the 18th century and became nearly impossible to sort of know what it was that, um, where certain things were and, and to create a, a sort of comparable dialogue between those excavations in the 30s and things we did yesterday. So uh, basically what I, my contribution was to come in and say, well, we're just gonna do it all in DAX. Um, so we, what we really, I think what I can contribute to this story here is that we at Mount Vernon are using DAX as our primary cataloging system now. And we're actually going back and working with legacy collections, attempting to bring them up to the standards and reanalyze them and enter them into the projects, uh, into the project list for Mount Vernon. We're also, uh, our, all of our current excavations are done from the very first um, with a sort of DAX focus, DAX database in mind. Um, and what this has really done is allowed me, particularly as a curator, uh, to begin to tie together these different uh, periods of, of archeological history at Mount Vernon to answer real historical questions. Um, everything from, uh, you know, uh, Sort of those administrative museum-based questions, like um, what kind of what kind of decorations were on the creamware that George Washington ordered? Well, we can begin to start analyzing that by looking at large swaths of data from this very particular community. So, Jillian is uh, conscious of time and prompted me to go no, forward. No, I, I, uh, advanced. No, no. There we go. <laughs> it's good. No, it's good. It's good. I need to. Um, and uh, so now I, I will sort of transition and sort of say I, this this notion about sort of looking at a community. Uh, and particularly, uh, you know, Mount Vernon has always had a focus on George Washington nat naturally. Uh, but this ties also to my own personal research interest because obviously DAX, you know, in its name is talking about comparative slavery and it has obviously had a focus on African-American lives and, and, and enslaved African lives uh, th more broadly throughout the, throughout the Atlantic. Um, but what I, my dissertation project is actually focusing on uh, the, the, the Great House uh, at uh, Stewart Castle in Jamaica that uh, Jillian had referenced earlier. And uh, I think we'll hear a little bit more of from, uh, from Ivor in a little bit. Um, and, and really what my, my project is doing is attempting to, to, to um, uh, explore planta plantation uh, uh, in its full extent, right? So uh, Jillian and uh, Ivor and uh, uh, folks from UE uh, Mona had, had done some work at the, uh, the village site in 2007, I believe, Jillian, is that? Yeah. yeah. So uh, my dissertation project actually applied a lot of the same uh, techniques and methodologies that uh, they applied at the village site and at other sites throughout the Caribbean. And, and we're, we're using that as a, a method to develop a comparative data set for the planter household itself. Obviously, that, that household would be um, composed of all sorts of individuals. But again, sort of that detailed, in-depth, I hope, uh, look at sort of what are the practices that are happening there, particularly as it changes over time. Uh, as the night as the 18th uh, 18th century and the 19th century progress, um, so here here's just some imagery of of sort of some of the results that we had there. So um, I'm excited to do that, uh, but um, perhaps uh, our next uh, speakers might be able to also speak a little bit about that. Excellent, thanks, Sean. And I'm Thank going you. to just bring um, Ivor and uh, Ivor, Dr. Ivor Conley, up, and uh, he has actually made the journey. Um, down from the cockpit country in Jamaica to Kingston uh, to have reliable internet with Dr. Suzanne Francis Brown. So they're in the same room, but socially distant, and we'll pass the laptop back and forth. So Ivor, thank you so much for being here. Um, Ivor and I've worked together for um, 17 years uh, in Jamaica um, on a whole host of sites. And we don't, we're really running down on time. So I'm not gonna gas on about all those collaborations that might, 
be another live stream where we talk just about our work in Jamaica. But Ivor, I'd love to hand it over to you. Ivor's an archaeologist and executive director of the Genesis Project um, and focuses specifically on Taino, but works very closely with us on all of our excavations um, at Stewart Castle and Papine and Mona Estates in Jamaica. So take it away, Ivor. Uh, thank you very much, Julian, and appreciate your having me here. Thank it's you for being here. Okay, um, our association with DAX has been mainly through field schools. Uh, so we involve a lot of students so from the University of the West Indies on the Stuart Castle site, Mona, and the Papine sites. But just backing up a bit, I was studying at the University of the West Indies, Mona, when I first met Gillian Galley in the academic year 2003-2004. She assisted the archaeology lecturer Philip Allsworth Jones in teaching the final year students in historical archeology. span I took this undergraduate course while pursuing my master's in heritage studies. As a part of her input, Gillian introduced us to methods of analysis using the Excel spreadsheet. This was new to us and this was for us an innovation, uh, but it was only the first of many innovations that Gillian introduced. At the site of Stuart Castle, mentioned made of Stuart Castle throughout, in the north of Jamaica, and at the Papine and Mona sites on the south section of the island, Gillian used shovel test pits, STPs. Dax's use of these STPs moved beyond the usual use of auger holes to identify where to dig on a site, to that of actually collecting and analyzing artifacts and using these data for spatial analysis, among other analytical processes. And it, it sounds sort of trite at this stage, but um, when something is new to you, it's exciting. <laughs> and I have subsequently adopted STPs for my excavations in prehistoric sites and adapted these accordingly. I presently uh, use much of the DAX protocols. I mean, not in the full ex extent, but <laughs> for, for field work mostly um, in, in all my archeological investigations. And we're currently working on a project which is not uh, prehistoric, but um, at Fort Stewart, Bastion House. And we are using DAX protocols with a little apology because it's not perfectly applied. It's okay. <laughs> another, another innovation. I, I spent three months in 2010 on a fellowship with DAX at Monticello, where Fraser Nyman introduced me to the use of mathematical formulation as an archaeological analytical tool. I, I mean, with apology, I find this was sheer genius on his part. It worked very well for my PhD thesis, and I was awarded a PhD with high commendation. Thank you, Dax. <laughs> Over the 17 years, my association with Gillian Galley and Dax, I have valued this association and hope and expect it to continue and to even strengthen in the future. And here ends my short presentation. <laughs> ah, thank you, Ivor. Thank you. <laughs> and there's another shot of Stuart Castle. But yes, we uh, we actually had plans to be with Ivor uh, and Suzanne and a field crew of students um, from the University of West Indies there this summer. Uh, that will have to wait, um, but soon mm -hmm. come. As, as we say, right? <laughs> Soon come. <laughs> uh, oh, and, and these are just some qu other quick shots about uh, fellowships and, and internships that we have uh, done specifically with uh, students from Jamaica and, and archaeologists from Jamaica. Uh, so I'll bring up Suzanne Francis Brown. Um, I know we're going over our, our time, but we uh, want to keep going because we've got a little bit more. She's our last speaker. Um, Dr. Francis Brown is a historian, um, an active historian uh, in Jamaica, and she is the emeritus curator of the University of West Indies Museum, uh, actually the founding curator of the museum for the University of the West Indies. Um, so I will let her talk about how we've been collaborating since 2008. Um, yeah. January 2008, so the whole year. The whole year. Exactly, <laughs> the whole year, that's right. Uh, Thanks, Gillian. Um, 
very much a pleasure to to join you. I'm going to talk very quickly about three aspects of um, the collaboration so far uh, with DAX. One, the DAX internships in historical archaeology. I'm going to talk a little bit more about also fellowships on Monticello. And then thirdly, um, aspects of DAX field schools in Jamaica and specifically Mona and Papine. So I'm going to try and gallop through through those quite quickly. Um, my having having met Gillian on site at Mona uh, in 2008, in January 2008, um, I was given the opportunity to participate in the DAX internship in historical archaeology program. Um, the, the one of the the things that uh, DAX has done has related to work in St. Kitts and Nevis in the digital in digital archaeology, um, collaborating to further scholarship on slavery through the development of integrated and diverse archaeological and historical data um, on this whole period uh, experience of enslavement, enslavement for men and women on 18th century and 19th century sugar estates in the Caribbean. Um, my experience was on Nevis. Uh, we went in from May to June 2008. Uh, we stayed at the Das Center State. And one of the things that I really had to mention, uh, I was looking back at the briefing sheet that we were given before we left. And it said, students should be advised that archaeological excavation is a physically, and ta physically taxing exercise. It entails bending, shoveling, and lifting, and carrying of equipment and buckets of dirt. Um, I know that. All of you are, are very aware, but it, it seemed worth um, mentioning it. Uh, we worked on the New River Estate in Nevis. Um, there, it's an estate for which there were, and I think the next slide up has a 19th century plat showing the village on the New River Estate. Uh, and we were basically doing field excavation, processing of finds, and also minor data entry on on this estate in that in that village area, which uh, was on a number of terrace sites going up, um, quite dry, uh, very, very windy, um, but but fascinating in terms of what was coming out of the ground. And all of that material would be on the DAX website for anybody with interest. Um, DAX also did work on the spring in St. Kitts, uh, just to mention that. So the second thing I wanted to, to mention to you was uh, fellowships at Monticello, which is something that uh, Ivo did a DAX fellowship. I was able in 2009 to be the, the first, I think, the first West Indian um, scholar, even uh, ICJS Institute of um, had this Jefferson Studies <laughs> uh, fellowship, and I was able to spend six weeks at uh, Monticello doing work specifically related to slave quarter replication, interpretation, and presentation. Uh, we were looking at doing a um, a replication project at Papin Village uh, on the Mona, what's now the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies. Uh, that still hasn't come to, it's still on our back burner, but uh, the work that I was able to do um, was very, very relevant. Um, apart from visiting at Monticello, I was able to do some work. Gillian and I took a trip down to Colonial Williamsburg, people like Wyoni and, and Ed, Ed Chapel. Um, were very, very helpful. Also look, went up to Poplar Forest. Uh, so a lot of, of very, very important and interesting work, which was able to, to pull back into what I was doing at, at um, in the Caribbean. And the third thing I want to mention is uh, two of the sites of the field work that DAX has done in the Caribbean. Uh, Sean and Ivor mentioned Stuart Castle. Uh, I've done more work on Mona and Papin, which are both old sugar plantations, 18th to 19th century sugar plantations on the site of what is now the University of the West Indies. Um, there are adjacent plantations, both of them somewhere in the region of a thousand acres and between 150 and 200 enslaved individuals at various times uh, over, over the years. Um, there was quite a lot of um, material that was available. Uh, the plat that you're looking at is one of those things. This is something I have done some work on prior to DAX coming in. I should mention that when DAX has been in Jamaica, the Jamaica National Heritage Trust, uh, the University of the West Indies have been key collaborators with DAX and, and uh, UVA has also um, been involved at, in field schools at, at various points. 
So the first fields, the first opportunity to do field work was in 2008, uh, something like 390 STPs dug, um, covering about 54% of the village. First, we processed about 10,000 artifacts that year. And then DAX came back uh, to work with us again in 2009 on Papine, 2010 Papine and Mona, and in 2011 on the dependency, particularly dependent, dependency area of the one of the Mona great houses. And that's a story all, all on its own. Uh, so these are just some of the images, some of the persons who have worked on it and some of the artifacts that uh, have been pulled up over time on both uh, the Papine and the, and the Mona Sugar Estate. Uh, and the other thing that I would say is that we, Jillian and I, have continued to collaborate, um, pulling together this, um, this, this way in which archaeology and history can speak to each other and help to illuminate uh, situations, especially relating to the enslaved population. So right now we've been looking at particularly um, whether di the diversification of the economic output of estates that started out as sugar estates has any impact on the persons who actually live and work on those estates. Uh, and we've also been looking at some of the old and some new um, possibilities in terms of records that can help us shine some light. So Gillian, thank you. And uh, we look forward to, to more. Excellent. Thank you, Suzanne. And uh, Suzanne uh, is, a good, is a great segue because in fact, uh, for those of you who want to know more about our research, you can tune in tomorrow at noontime um, for a, a live stream Zoom talk. Uh, you have to go to the DAX website and register, um, go to the Discover with DAX page on DAX.org and you can register. And Suzanne and I will be talking about uh, precisely the collaboration um, that we're doing on agricultural diversification and its impacts on enslaved laborers in Jamaica. Um, so we've uh, come to the end, we've gone over our time, but we are happy to take any, if there are any live questions out there, um, uh, about bring all the panelists in and I believe we got one question from the audience, which is, are you ever surprised with a find? Um, could Interested in surprises or insights that come from comparative analyses or working with legacy collections? Put that out to, to the group to see. Um. Uh, I'm, I'm currently working on a project in, um, well, I, obviously in Jamaica, St. Mary, it's, uh, it's Fort Stewart. Okay. Now, um, like Stewart Castle, we say that it is a fortified house. And I sort of had my doubts about it being, you know, more than just that. It's just the style of the day, you know, we're, we're repelling maroons and so on. And then to my surprise, to my pleasant surprise, maybe, we found a musket ball on the site yesterday. And I was like, oh, okay. Okay, I will keep yourself quiet now. It was a real place. I mean, there were perhaps really repelling maroons here. <laughs> so that was a nice time for me. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in here. This um, was actually something I worked on a little bit when I was doing my dissertation and shortly after my dissertation but now that we've been working in the dax database with the comparative mission archaeology portal and doing very refined detailed analysis of the composition of the clays that the native american ceramics are made out of um, we're beginning to find out that what was always assumed to be a change in pottery technology as a result of the historic period now that we're doing this fine grain detailed analysis and combining it with the fine grain detail excavation uh, strategies we had, we're actually finding that this change in pottery technology occurred long, probably hundreds of years before archaeologists from the 60s and 70s who described these types, you know, really thought. And that's without this fine detailed analysis that we're now doing in the DAX database, we probably wouldn't have been able to capture that. Um, although I did, like I said, I did have an idea that that might have been a possibility when I was doing my dissertation. But 
using the power of this database, it's really helping us answer uh, changes over time that we couldn't really recognize before. That's excellent. Very cool. Yeah. We've found a number of really amazing artifacts just going through our legacy collections and cataloging them into DAX. Uh, when I was at Monticello in 2012, uh, as part of my fellowship, one of the DAX catalogers, Jesse was um, kind of my, my DAX mentor, uh, and he was helping catalog some of the artifacts and was cataloging some glass artifacts and actually discovered uh, that we had a a very special glass in the collection uh, that says, God save ye king. And they were specifically made for the coronation of King George the uh, first. And we had one in an earlier uh, Drayton site, a pre Drayton site. And so just, you never know what you might find in these legacy collections when you're really looking at them so carefully through the lens of decks. Wow. Thank you all so much. Um, we've gone far over our time, but it's been really delightful to have everybody here and to hear about your ongoing projects. And thank you for taking the time. And, and thanks to all the viewers out there for joining us and sticking with us. Um, I don't think we have any more questions, but you can always write to me at Monticello jgalley at monticello.org um, and uh, ask more questions and please continue to explore the DAX website. There's new data going up all the time. So thank you. Thank you, Jillian. <laughs> yes, thank you. Jillian. Bye. Have a great <laughs> Good day. Good to see everybody. <laughs>